Yeah, I heard from Maxie that the guys are riding you pretty hard about going to this tryout. You know, Vince, might not be the worst thing to let this one go. Man can only take so much failure. In 2002, during Monday Night Football, the halftime feature kind of came and stole the show. It was about an Eagles fan who was a teacher and bartender who put the lesson plan down and somehow made the roster. The story had taken place 30 years earlier and Hollywood execs wondered why it hadn't been made into a movie. Come to find out it had inspired a film, only not the one you probably expected. The garbage picking field goal kicking Philadelphia phenomenon, yes, that's the real title, was a straight to TV Disney movie, came out in 1998. This was four years before that Monday night segment ever actually aired. The movie starred Tony Danza as Barney Gorman, a Philly man with an unprestigious job who gets a random tryout with the Eagles and then becomes a middle aged rookie playing on special teams. It's an obvious take on the story of Vince Papali. But after the Monday night segment gave more of Vince's real story, Disney seemed to sit back in the exec chair and take another look. Four years later in 2006, the movie Invincible dropped, not to be confused with the animated Amazon series. This one starred Mark Wahlberg and was based on the real life story that's hard to wrap your mind around. A 30 year old diehard Eagles fan, a season ticket holder, a regular ass dude, gets a tryout with his favorite team despite never even playing football in college. Dude makes the roster and is actually in real life a part of turning his struggling team around. A lot of us fans like to talk crazy on Twitter about who should be fired and who ain't doing their job. But if the situation arose, would you really be willing to take it to this level? And not the glamorous part either. The movie follows Vince's story much closer than the original extremely loose adaptation, but they still changed a lot and this could probably be considered a somewhat loose adaptation. It is true that Vince Papali didn't play college ball, but his athletic experience went further than the backyard. I still enjoy this movie just like I always have, but after taking the time to actually research the real story, I think I managed to find an even greater respect for Vince. And though a few of the biggest movie moments don't happen in real life, a few of the moments that did might be better than the movie. How you go from section 700 to out there on the field? He got in and got out, man, lived to tell the story. Today we are talking about a legend who lived every fan's dream. The dream was turned into a movie and inspires people across the world. This is what happened to Vince Papali from Invincible. <sighs> All right, real quick before we jump in, it's time for a word from today's video sponsor, Aura. Identity theft is the fastest growing crime in the country. Real talk, you got a new victim every 14 seconds. So Aura offers identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and an antivirus software all combined into one app. You probably got at least one of these services, but without all the tools, you just locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Imagine waking up one day and then you log into your email, only to see that recently your password was changed. Then you start getting notifications about activity from your bank, credit card, crypto accounts, whatever, etc. It's a scary reality for way too many people. But Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers, and they send alerts fast right to your phone and email. When I first hooked up with Aura, they found my info on the dark web a few too many times but made it easy to rectify. Aura also gives near real-time alerts on suspicious credit inquiries, and Aura's VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal info safe and encrypted. So protect your your family and yourself from identity theft at aura.com slash flimlo again that's aura.com slash flimlo and it's also linked down below in the description and if you sign up right now aura is going to give you a two-week free trial when you use my link so you can see for yourself how many times your info or your family's info comes up on the dark web and then most importantly you can do something about it let me know in the comments if your personal information had been compromised in this case information is everything and you won't regret it Man, shout out to Aura once again for sponsoring the video. And without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. Mm. 
The movie picks up in 1970s South Philly, where Vince is said to be from in the film. In real life, he's actually from Glen Nolden, Pennsylvania, but they changed it in the movie. Probably something to do with this dude. It's hard times financially for a whole lot of people, and to make matters worse, them Eagles wasn't flying. I checked to see if the Eagles were as bad as the movie made them out to be, and from 1967 to 1977, the Philadelphia Eagles didn't have a single winning season, not one winning season in a whole 10 years. At the game, we meet Vince, a diehard Eagles fan, season ticket holder to a team that hasn't won in a decade. Dude this all the way down on his luck, his team's bad, he loses his primary income, his girl leaves him. But just when it all seems hopeless, the head coach of his favorite team pops up on the TV at his second job and announces NFL tryouts that are open to the public. In the movie, Vince is just a guy who's the best player on his semi-organized, non-padded, full-contact football team. A random dude off the street who's never played organized ball in real life there's a decent amount of differences here but it would be easy to confuse what's real and what's fake but let's start from the beginning here's some things the movie doesn't cover then work our way back up to this point it wasn't that he didn't have a fondness for the game but during his first three years they said vince was too small so vince switched sports and he went to basketball and also in track and field he did the long jump and triple jump but his main event was one that strikes fear in the hearts of many the most dangerous event vince did the pole ball and Vince ain't just do it, he won a district championship. And even beyond that, he finished fourth in the state. His best high school pole vault was 12 feet, nine inches. Back then, that was enough to make him top 10 in Philly. His senior year, they finally let him out on the football field. And despite it being his first year, he was named all county. But it wasn't quite enough to get him a football scholarship. So he accepted a track offer from St. Joseph University. He probably would have walked onto the football team, but that was one small problem. St. Joseph doesn't have one. You can tell Vince has a deep reverence for the Eagles. The way he talks about his favorite players from back in the day, he seemed to have a respect for sports history in general. And his time in the league wasn't the only time he competed at historical landmarks. While he was at St. Joseph, he competed in the United States Track and Field Federation College Development Pole Vault Cup. In this particular year, it was at Madison Square Garden. Vince came alive under the bright lights, posting a jump of 14 feet, 9 inches. And Vince was that dude. That was enough for first place. So in the movie, Vince is kind of portrayed as this loser and despite what I'm about to tell you he could have still been down on his luck so in 1968 he graduated from St. Joe with a whole master's degree in marketing and management over the last couple decades he's put those skills to use but following graduation he had to take what was available just like the movie Vince worked as a bartender slash bouncer at night by day a substitute teacher ran a coach at his old high school dude wasn't just down on his luck kind of floating through life he had a master's degree a few jobs Jobs. He might not have been where he ultimately wanted to be, but he was educated, working, and still ambitious because while he was doing all of that, he was working on a second degree, and this one was going to be in secondary counseling. He was committed to stabilizing his career in education, but in the back of his mind, it was a dream that never died. For some people, these scenes with the grown ass men playing non padded, full contact football games after work is one of the more unrealistic points of the movie. However, while he was doing all that other stuff, working multiple jobs, going to school and everything else, Vince also played in rough and tough football leagues all the time. That was the only way he knew to scratch his football itch. Vince Papali simply loved the game. He loved the contact. He loved the camaraderie. And he even said that these are his favorite scenes in the movie. It just showed the pure innocence and pure joy of playing. And to me, it was a bunch of guys who was all over the hill, but when they played the game, they became kids again. And it transcended time. Now the movie makes you think this is the height of Vince's football career prior to his time in the NFL. That's actually not the case at all. There's Vince, 44 closing in on a Birmingham return rate. So he took out a blocker and sacrificed himself so his teammates could make the play. Vince was that kind of guy. Keep watching, he'll be back. Vince never let up. See, there he is now, finishing off the play. <laughs> So if you follow me for a while, you know a few times a year, I drop a via stressing importance of alternative pro leagues, i.e. spring leagues like the XFL and USFL. It gives guys like a PJ Walker a chance to get back into the league. 
and it gives guys like Vince Papali a chance they never got. When the opportunity arose, Vince played in the Seaboard Football League, a short-lived semi-pro league that lasted from 1971 to 1974. Here's a crazy little fun fact that couldn't wait to the end. So while Vince is in semi-pro, a team from Vince's league was selected to play a game against the New York Jets rookies. Vince's team was not selected, but somehow dude was always in close proximity. He was this damn close to at least tasting his NFL dream. I would imagine Vince was probably pretty bummed out at the time, but the universe had something way better in store for dude. But as far as the Seaboard Football League, things really didn't go great for them. Imagine owning that league, and in 1972, you scrimmaging against the NFL. Then two years later in 1974, your entire league is completely out of business. That, my dude, is called the Spring League Struggle. So the Seaboard Football League folded because of the arrival of a brand new league called the World Football League. I'm assuming that was better pay because most players switched over and Vince Papali was of course one of those players. Philly's WFL team was called the Philadelphia Bell. So remember, Vince has been to college, got a whole master's degree, been out of college, got jobs and played in the SFL. Time waits for no man and he was getting up there. So when he went to try out with the Philadelphia Bell of the WFL, he lied to the guys and told them he was 24. But he put that marketing degree to use and he sold himself well. He had to slightly been the truth, dude was actually down near 30. You could get away with a lot before the internet. So he had to lie his way in, but guess what? He was in. And it just so happened that the Philadelphia Bell were playing in the first game of the new league's history. And I don't know if his team got the ball first or if the other team went three and out, but when you look to see who made the first reception in the WFL, Vince actually caught the first pass in WFL history. We don't have that shot, but we did find a few others. What are the odds of that happening? But this dude whole life, he just beat the odds, bro, like over and over again. It's even wilder when you consider the fact that Vince, though he may have had the skills, wasn't primarily used as a wide receiver. I don't know how much they was passing a ball in these WFL games, but what I do know is that they played a 20 game season. And in 20 whole games, Vince had a total of 120 yards receiving, despite averaging 13.4 yards per catch. So what actual value did they really see in Vince? Just like in the movie, he was a special teams ace. A lot of it's built on one, two, toughness, attitude, and all that other stuff. And he had all that, plus a unique set of skills, including speed and an ability to get off the press. And that would set him up perfectly to be a great gunner. Stand out at that position and coaches want you on the team. And if you live and die with your favorite team wins and losses, you know how important the special teams dudes are. Now this next part has two different stories associated with it. Some sources on the internet claim that in 1976, Vince's performance with the Philadelphia Bell earned him a meeting with coach Dick Vermeil and that he was directly invited to come to the open tryout. Now Vince's website denies this, but it would make sense, especially because the Philadelphia Bell were right there in the Eagles backyard. There was bound to be a few players that could make an NFL roster and the team would have obviously been on the Eagles radar because at one time the Philly Bell were getting headlines for selling more tickets to home games than the Eagles. This is a quick little funny story about the Philadelphia Bell of the WFL. The Philly Bell reported 65,000 tickets sold for their very first home game which was crazy because the Eagles only averaged 60,000 you might be asking yourself how is this possible the answer is very simple it wasn't apparently the Philadelphia Bell had inflated their numbers and not by a little by like 50,000 tickets so when people found out and you know that they did the bad press was worse than piece of gay in the USFL he crossed the line so we had to deal with it. I don't eat chicken salad, and I was like, is there another option? Can I get a slice of pizza? Cost of doing business, I'm gonna have to let you go. But anyway, did Vince get invited to the tryout or did it play out like it played out in the movie? Vince's website seems to claim that the way it happened in the movie is the way it happened in real life. Aside from the fact that Vince's friends didn't have to convince him to go for it, dude always wanted to do it and he wasn't gonna let this pass. Either way, he obviously goes to the tryout. And I only spent so much time on this because the website goes out of his way to directly refute this fact. So I have to imagine that for them, this must be important. But a more interesting detail, in my opinion at least, is that 
and unlike the movie, Vince wasn't out of work. When the opportunity for the tryout came about, they wasn't just cutting his hours like he wasn't important. Dude actually had to take a leave of absence from the school. And when he went in to talk to the people, it was positive energy and they encouraged him to chase this once in a lifetime opportunity. Another aspect of the movie that kind of feels made up is the letter from Vince's ex-wife saying he would never amount to anything. But according to Vince, this letter actually exists. When he divorced his first wife, she really wrote this. Damn. Both of the love interest storylines from the movie really happened, but neither of them happened during the time frame of the movie. Vince got that letter from his ex five years before the tryout, but he could have still kept it around for motivation, I guess. Now his main love interest in the film is Janet, but in real life, Vince was with another ex-wife at the time. They would later get divorced and then he would meet Janet, but those two wouldn't become a couple until years and years later. But above all else, there's one thing I had to know. Did this diehard Eagles fan marry a Giants fan? Did the universe really bring these enemies together? Absolutely not. This is completely made up. When they were pitching a movie, they really wanted to get the NFL on board. They figured they'd introduce another team into the fray. Also, it adds to the conflict of the story when the love interest is a fan of a division rival. Now in the movie, the coach knows he's gonna pick Vince during the tryout. A lot of little winks and nods, he likes the guy, okay we get it. But I guess for suspense purposes, following the tryout, nobody says a single word to Vince. Dude just yells out, alright it's over, go home and people leave. So the next thing you know, Vince just so happens to be having car trouble. Which allows Dick Vermeil time to walk over and formally invite him to camp. And this makes for a cool scene. I would even call it a great scene if it made sense the way that we got here. But two dudes bonding over a truck that won't start, it just bypasses the brain and goes straight to the heart. In real life, they told Vince to come into the office and invited him to camp like normal people would. Now to help paint the picture of Vince's first days in training camp, check out this excerpt from an article by Joey Hess at The Snapper. Heading into training camp, one of the first drills Vermeil put him in was 7 on 7, a situation Papali was well versed in. These dudes are trying to take my head off, and I just laugh because I took harder hits when I was out there in rough touch league. Despite the familiarity of the 707 drill, the road to the NFL was not easy for Vince Papali. Dude put in a lot of hard work and had to overcome challenges along the way. The biggest challenge was obviously overcoming the stigma that I didn't have the right resume or the right pedigree, that I didn't play college ball and I was 30 years old, and that has never been done before. It wasn't too long before Papali was recognized as a serious potential member of the team. He worked to prove to his teammates that he was the real deal and that he had what it took to play in the NFL. They realized after I started competing so hard and wiping guys out down the field is when they realized this guy is for real. He also said that he practiced every single play, quote, like it was the Super Bowl. But Pally went on to say, there's no letting up. You got to give it everything you got every minute of every day. That was his mentality as he headed into every practice and every game. That first week of training camp, it was rookies and free agents. Week, I hit everything that moved. And I don't care if they were going to do a sweep on the left-hand side and I was a Z receiver on the right. I still hit that cornerback and let him pay. And that pissed him off. That's why you saw in the movie, you know, they call me all pro practice and this and that. You got to lighten up a little bit, dude. And I says, hey, I'm just trying to make the team make an impression. Dude had the perfect mentality coming in. While he had decent receiving skills, Vince was the type that looked forward to special teams. Because you know a lot of wide receivers, once they get in them guns, the drills that's when they start to kind of go through the motions remember vince had been a standout on special teams in the wfl and that skill set coupled with his mindset took him far but i don't care how strong willed you are at some point that mindset had to be tested because training camp in the 70s was a whole different beast and that's going to require a lot more work and sacrifice than many of you are used to six straight weeks of two a day six straight weeks of two a day six straight weeks of two a days for what now obviously I know training camps have gotten much much lighter in today's league but that six straight weeks of two a day sounded so crazy to me that for a second I thought it was a Hollywood embellishment but a quick google search brought me to an SI article about the 1970 Oakland Raiders and their eight week training camp where they were basically held captive 60 miles away from their families. Ironically the article was about how much the players loved it and that seems excessive but that's how they did it back then. So speaking of excessive did you know that they also played six preseason games back at that time. In 1970, the AFL and NFL merged. The owners was feeling themselves and saw there was money to be made. So they just bam, bam, bam added hella preseason games and forced season ticket holders to pay 
for the additional exhibition games or lose their season tickets now i'm hoping y'all stay with me here's how all that ties back into the story of vince papali so remember in 1970 when the merger happened vince papali himself was a season ticket holder so six years before he ever got invited to camp he had to come up with more money in order to keep his season ticket when the extra games were added it hurt vince at first but fast forward a few years and now he's trying to make the team crazy how the extra games go from a curse to a blessing even after the eight week camp six preseason games they still never officially announced that he made the team check out this excerpt from julia bakken skies at philadelphiaeagles.com it opens with a quote from vince they never told me i made the team so i came into the locker room after the sixth preseason game i went into the locker room and there was my name up in plastic i had a locker and my name was spelled correctly there were a couple of wide receivers that were still on the roster whose names weren't up there but i still didn't know if i had made the team then right before practice starts the guy that we know is the turk he's the person who cuts guys from the team and there he was he came walking towards him. i thought he was walking towards me and was gonna cut me at that point i really lifted the playbook and was ready to hand it to him but he just started laughing he ended up grabbing a guy next to me and said coach wants to see you bring your playbook now I didn't want to throw the party right then or pop the champagne because I still wasn't told officially. Finally I get out on the field and now I'm looking around. I'm thinking oh my god I think I'm an eagle but I don't know. Then coach Vermeil walks over to me and he looks down with his great smile and he says hey old man congratulations you're a Philadelphia eagle. Welcome to the team. Vince was now officially a 30-year-old rookie, making him the oldest rookie in NFL history to play in the league with zero college experience. With one small caveat, it doesn't include kickers. Vince wasn't a one-season charity case either. This man played with the Eagles from 76 to 78. He played 41 of 44 possible regular season games during that span, super reliable, always ready to go playing primarily on special teams as a gunner dude had 20 career tackles and stayed opportunistic recovering two fumbles to get the ball back for the offense these special teams dudes can make or break a game they could win a game for you they could lose a game for you it's not the highest profile spot but extremely important position he only made one catch during his three-year career a 15-yard reception on the third and really long they ended up falling short at a first down by a few yards now you'll notice i didn't bring up one of the biggest moments of the movie vince's special teams touchdown that wins the game for the eagles the reason i ain't bring it up is because it didn't happen but i'm cool with them adding it in because it should have happened this is the play from the movie and the real play side by side. As you can see, Vince forces one of the blockers to run into his own guy. This collision causes a muff punt. But because Vince doesn't make contact with the punt returner and it was ruled that he didn't push the blocker into the returner, the ball bounces off one of the guy's hands or shoulder pads and Vince smoothly catches it, never breaks stride, and runs clean into the end zone just like in the movie. Now in the movie they make a couple key changes. To get the shot that makes the film they had to make a few adjustments. For one they move the returner up way closer to midfield, giving Vince more time to run with the ball in his hand. And to avoid NFL rules ruining the movie. They changed the muff punt to a forced fumble and pretty much that's the movie magic. A muff punt can be recovered by the kicking team but once they recover the ball it can't be advanced. But a fumble can be advanced by the kicking team. If the guy has possession then loses it that's a fumble. Now if he never gains possession it's a muff. Fumble can be advanced muff cannot so while he doesn't score the touchdown in real life he gave his team amazing field position and they do go on to score the touchdown if you're wondering why you can't advance a muff punt i too found myself wondering why this rule existed i came across a plausible answer from a guy on reddit he goes by the name of legacy zebra he said until the late 20s the kicking team was able to advance a muff punt but there were fewer and fewer returns because returners were letting the kick bounce instead of trying to catch it and risking an easy score he said the rule makers wanted to increase the number of punt returns so they made the ball dead when it was recovered by the kicking team that actually makes sense okay moving on now i've been saying this whole time that vince played three years but he was actually planning to play in a fourth but unfortunately for vince he injured his shoulder in that last eight week ridiculous training camp not to mention let's be real he was a 30 year old rookie and you know 
my dude wouldn't get you know younger i'm not sure how it actually works since he didn't play in that last season but vince was credited with four full seasons which qualified him for his nfl pension and all the players who retired i think before 03 were able to get their pension early it kicked in at 45 now i know the pension ain't making these dudes rich but he did get them back for them season ticket prices on top of his pension vince put his degree to use making himself into a highly sought after motivational speaker and author a spokesman for several different companies he's the current secretary slash treasurer of the philadelphia chapter of the nfl alumni association and he's used the celebrity the movie has afforded him to continue to make great financial moves and take care of his family in 1993 vince and janet got married and look at these kids man still going strong until to this very day he also had a son who played in the usfl dude has some tryout opportunities with nfl teams vince is still a diehard eagles fan to this day so you can imagine how he felt when the eagles won the super bowl back in 2018 of course dude was at the game vince papali's football story is one of a kind the likes of which probably won't ever be duplicated but on the other hand there could be a guy out there right now reading a letter like this getting ready to make history